Hello and greetings from Birmingham, England. This is my talk for the conference on ambivalences. I'm sorry that I cannot be with you in person, but I hope that this presentation will give you some food for thought. My understanding is that this will be broadcast at the conference on a, a Saturday somewhere around 6 p.m. And I guess that is the perfect occasion to talk about the ambivalences of food. Um, it's rather likely that throughout this talk you'll be here about food and have that craving for food that you usually have on a Saturday evening. And that's just one of the many ambivalences that I will uh, talk about. And it's also something that foreshadows the peculiarity of this uh, topic. When we talk about uh, food, um, well, the thing is we're really uh, need it. There's a lot of environmental rhetoric about what do people really need? Do they need to fly to distant beaches? Do they need a big car? Do they need large suburban houses? Well, humanity made it through much of its history without cell phones, but uh, food is one of those essentials like water and air that humans just need to get somehow. At the same time, there are a lot of requirements that come with our daily uh, bread, sporting with the space. According to the FAO, the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization, agriculture claims 38% of the global land um, surface. So it certainly matters uh, how we produce our food. And that's the, actually the tension that has brought me uh, back to this uh, food topic time and again. For now, more than two decades, um, I entered environmental history many, many years ago with a book on pollution control. In that case, the paradigm was always uh, rather uh, clear. You know, it was about, you need to cut down on pollutants. How do you do that? Pretty complicated story, but at least you had a clear intellectual paradigm. Now, you do not have anything like that when you talk about uh, agriculture, because there you have several rationales. You need food for of a decent quality for uh, humans. You need, a sustainability of food production. It's not just important to produce it now, but also to have certainty that you can produce it in uh, the near future in certain places. There is the impact on uh, the environment more widely. Um, if 38% of the Earth's surface are um, in agricultural use, I guess that means that there is a very significant impact on the rest of the globe. Um, and there are, not to be forgotten, the interests of those who produce food. Farmers need a reason uh, to produce more food that they can eat themselves. And that same holds true for uh, others involved in the global uh, food system. They need some kind of incentive. And in the modern era, that incentive was usually uh, of a monetary nature. It just paid to work in barns and in fields. And it was not a given that it would actually pay. So agriculture is always about some kind of balance between these rationales. And if you ignore one of them, um, you end up in trouble fairly quickly. Um, but it's not just the ambivalences uh, that linger. This is also a talk about how one might find narratives about dealing with ambivalences. And that is a point probably that has probably made at this conference already, but I'll say nonetheless here, um, that you know, as scholars, we are not at liberty to say it's complicated. You can do that with your relationship status on Facebook, but for academic purposes, you need a clear argument, even where the situation looks eminently unclear. Um, and I'll applaud these different uh, rationales uh, by looking at the Green Revolution, the transformation of agricultural production after 1945, an event that is commonly viewed as a event of the global south, as you'll see, this is somewhat honestly, and I'll make a point throughout this talk about talking about the green revolution in the global south as a global event. But maybe I should say a few things about my research um, and what is behind this talk. The keynote is a rather peculiar um, type of presentation. It can be commonsensical, it can be provocative. Um, very often the temptation is big to draw on research that you have done. Uh, well, there is plenty of that. In my case, this is my, um, well, the German version of my book, the English version, The Vortex, is uh, out in, uh, uh, in English um, next uh, spring. So I could just draw on uh, this book and take a chapter or two and paraphrase that. But I thought it would be more fun, um, not least because we'll have a discussion on this keynote, it would be more fun to uh, talk about something that I have not 
written on extensively yet. The Green Revolution, as it happens, was a chapter in this book for some time. Um, it wasn't written, but it was meant to be a chapter. Um, in a book of this kind, if you open it, you see that there are different stories that um, act as um, nodes in a network of interrelations. And um, you, in a, in a book like that, you play with different nodes and see how they work out. Um, well, for some time, the Green Revolution was one of those uh, nodes. Uh, but it didn't make the final list. Uh, the chapter was never written. Uh, but I come back to it now because it is uh, a key issue uh, in the project that I currently do, which is in some ways a follow-up project to the Vortex. That project is a global history of monoculture, which is almost synonymous with um, a history of uh, agriculture in uh, the age of global modernity. In a way, it is a problem-oriented way to write a history um, of agriculture um, uh, worldwide. Uh, and it depends on a very simple question, why do modern food systems gravitate towards a reliance on one single uh, product? Um, and whether they do so in spite of plenty um, of problems that come with monoculture, environmental problems, social problems, political problems, economic problems. Um, monocultures are not really loved by uh, farmers and there are plenty of warnings that this is a bad idea. So when you take a critical uh, view of monoculture, that is not the wisdom of insight. That's something that you actually find in the textbooks uh, of earlier uh, days. This project is generally supported by the European Research Council. Uh, the official start was uh, last October. Um, and I thought I would dedicate the first year of this uh, wonderful uh, fellowship to think and read. Um, uh, I will have the start of a research group in the fall. Um, but this presentation is part of the uh, reflections that I have in that first year, and I please uh, receive it in this uh, sense. This is my way to make my way, own way through um, a topic and any comments on what it means to write a global history of uh, monoculture um, is greatly appreciated. My understanding is that after this, um, after watching this video, we will have a conversation via Zoom. And I can say um, already um, a day before that happens, I'm very much looking forward to this. Now, I would like to start um, my conversation on ambivalences with a moment where everything seemed clear. And one such moment comes every year when the Nobel Foundation announces the recipients of the Nobel Peace Prize. It's quite a circle. If you look at people who have received that award, you see on that the Theresa uh, Lech Valenza, Nelson Mandela, the Dalai Lama, um, Eli Wiesel, Desmond Tutu, Malala Yousafzai. Um, um, that's quite a circle of, of people. A lot of the awards went to people who ended armed conflicts or stopped them from happening in the first uh, place. Whatever now and then, um, the Nobel Peace Prize embraces uh, a wider definition of what it means to work for peace. Um, Malala, we see in the bottom right here, who lived for some time here in Birmingham, by the way. Um, uh, she's certainly um, an example of that. Last year, two journalists uh, received the Nobel Peace Prize. Uh, the year before, the World Food Program uh, received the Nobel Peace Prize. Um, for its efforts for its efforts to combat hunger, for its contribution to bettering conditions for peace in conflict affected areas, and for acting as a driving force in efforts to prevent the use of hunger as a weapon of war and conflict. That's um, um, the award uh, of 2020. It was exactly 50 years after another award went to efforts to combat uh, hunger. Um, the recipient then was this gentleman, Norman Borlaug, a native of Iowa, who studied forestry at the University of Minnesota uh, and then turned to plant pathology and plant breeding. He received the Nobel Peace Prize for, and I quote again, for having given a well-founded hope, the Green Revolution. That's not equivalent. And if you look at the picture of the award and you look at the kind of grin, I guess that is the kind of smile that you can get away with uh, when you have received the Nobel Peace Prize. Um, now, it's a noble idea to uh, think the Nobel Peace Prize goes to deserving people um, who are you know, carefully selected by wise people. Well, there is always a prehistory, and this includes some subliminal campaigning. In this case, it's fairly easy to trace it. Uh, the Green Revolution 
um, the term itself is revealing. Um, it was invented just two years before Borlaug received the award, invented by William Gott, uh, then the administrator of the US Agency for International Development. And it's no mystery what he was uh, thinking about when he coined that term, where in the late 60s, um, the Vietnam War is on, uh, red guerrillas destabilize uh, the uh, Asian countryside. Uh, there is a lot of talk about revolution among students. So it was really time for a revolution that came with a seal of approval from the US government. Um, and that was the Green Revolution, the promise of better life through American led scientific um, efforts. So the Green Revolution was political project from the start. Um, certainly a child of the uh, Cold War, but not something that really starts with the Cold War. And it's uh, interesting to look at the start of the Green Revolution in uh, Mexico, um, which is where Bollock received his first international assignment. He went to Mexico in 1944 for a breeding program uh, for wheat with funding from the Rockefeller Foundations. Well, 1944, you can obviously uh, think about one um, motive uh, for this. This is the time of the Second World War, um, making sure that Mexico would stay on the side of the Allies was, of course, a big part of the rationale. And the negotiations over this wheat improvement program were actually conducted on the uh, highest level up to Vice President um, uh, Henry Wallace, who um, happened to be the former U.S. Secretary of Agriculture. He was personally involved in these negotiations. But there was a second motive in play beyond diplomacy and grand strategy and the motive that is often in play when the U.S. is um, doing something diplomatic. This was also about the American way of doing business, which is, if I may summarize capitalism in one of its more aggressive forms. That was not the way Mexican way to do business at the time, at least not uh, when the Green Revolution started. In 1940, the six-year term of Mexican President Lazaro Cardenas, pictured here, came to an end. This period was marked by aggressive state intervention. Cardenas nationalized the oil industry and he appropriated large estates on redistributed the land to peasants. And he did so uh, in a vigorous manner at the end of his term, 47% of arable land had changed ownership. As land reform goes, that was one of the more robust ones in world history. Now, the new president of Mexico, uh, Manuel Avila Camacho, uh, was less interested in land reform or subsistence farming. So the um, Green Revolution was also an effort to bolster the American way of agriculture, where the question was not so much about how large is the land, but can you produce lots of stuff and sell it for profit? It's an effort to uh, support the turn towards profit-oriented farming um, that uh, caters to international markets. With that, one might assume that the first uh, step towards the satisfactory history of the Green Revolution would need to start with a critical assessment of US Cold War policy. But I think, in terms, the key term here is ambivalence. Well, I think there is uh, two reasons for caution. The first is that I think the critical view of US imperialism is up for revision. For a long time, it was a defining topic to, to um, you know, to, to point out how the talk about freedom and democracy is just camouflage for more nefarious interests. Uh, well, we currently see what another superpower does um, in Ukraine. Um, we also have seen over four years of Donald Trump what happens when he no longer pays lip service uh, to um, the beliefs that the US used to stand for. I'm sure you know about his entirely transactional attitude towards diplomacy. And you know about his fascination of dictatorial strongmen all around the world and how he never showed any discernible interest in democracy and human rights. And you know what happened. I, much has been made about the division of US society, but I think the real victims of the Trump's presidency are in Saudi Arabia, Hong Kong, Egypt, Russia. And I'm curious to see how this plays out in the literature um, um, in upcoming years. We're clearly no longer can just write uh, the history of Cold War America as the shenanigans of just another evil empire. There's a second reason why I'm reluctant to zoom in on the Cold War context. This point has something to do with narration. We need to move beyond 
linear narratives and we should move beyond um, the quest for some kind of pure unbiased history of the green revolution that is just out there and waiting to be um, uncovered. My approach is the other way around. In defining issues and chronological and spatial realms for study, we are um, defining a lot of what the narrative is um, about. And that is by setting these frames and setting our stage in a certain way, we get these linear narratives that feed the craving for cognitive certainty, stories where you have a clear villain, where you have shining heroes, and we have a moral bottom line um, at the end. Well, that no longer works in global history. I think that's one of the pitches for global history, that you cannot make any uh, games with um, thematic or geographic time frames. You always have a multitude of issues in play when you look at the globe in full. You always have multiple perspectives. Um, so you always need to think, how do we deal with this? Um, or to, if you want a more robust way to uh, phrase this, these linear need narratives with clear villains and shining heroes. Uh, that is the narratological equivalent of sugar water. It tastes well, it feeds your eminent needs, but it makes you sick and lazy in the long run. And yes, there are a lot of activists in the sugar water business, plenty of journalists, but also many academics who go with the flow. And I will leave it to your judgment whether the reason is moral or just an unwillingness to do the hard work. Um, my point is writing linear narratives is a waste of uh, resources um, and we should use the privileged position that we have as academics to write something else. So the challenge is to write multi-dimensional narratives. And the first step is to look at the different narratives in their own right. I've mentioned one already, the Cold War story about the American way of agribusiness. We should also take other narratives into account, even when these narratives no longer are as contentious or even erroneous in hindsight. Um, not the kind of fresh um, scenario that it used to be at some point. I'm talking about, for instance, Malthusian fears, the rationale of too many people, not enough food, that plays a crucial role in making the Green Revolution and then the narratives of the Green. Borlaug received the Nobel Peace Prize against the backdrop of widespread concerns over dramatic increase of the world's uh, population. And these fears triggered the specter of um, Robert Malthus um, and the specter of uh, widespread starvation due to lack of food. I have a long excourse on Malthus in my paper here. This would be the great moment to look around the audience and see whether people are getting tired or uh, people are attentive here. That's the downside of doing a video here, but I don't want to take any risks, so maybe I make this short. There was this concern um, that population growth would accelerate quicker than the production of food. You see on this graph here how the Malthusian catastrophe uh, plays out. At some point, population growth outgrows the increase in food production. That's what Malthus wrote um, in the late 18th and early 19th century. That's the principle of population growth. Um, this idea gained particular currency in the post-war years. The most famous product is Paul Ehrlich's bestseller, The Population uh, Bomb, an iconic book that uh, mirrors a much uh, wider concern. I could now go into how much did Malthus know about uh, this. Uh, well, not, not too much, though he was making his effort to do empirical work. But in, in the end, Malthus at this point is more a trope that drifts around and since is then seized upon the post-war uh, years and used to frame this apocalyptic vision um, of the future. Well, the demographic reality was different. Um, um, the population did grow at that time, but it grew most dramatically in the global south. And it occurred at a time of spectacular in economic growth in the industrial north. Um, and that trend is one that we're keenly aware of now. Um, the Anthropocene debate has, um, and, the, and the term of the Great Acceleration have uh, flagged that there was something dramatic happening in these years. Um, uh, the environmental footprint of Western industrial civilization has grown beyond all historical experiences in the post-war years. Um, and this is already a recognition at that time, um, not to the extent it is today, but it certainly did not go unobserved. Um, and against this backdrop, it was very gratifying to see an issue that did not in the first way um, affect or come back 
uh, to Western culpability. Population growth was particularly exploited in the global south. Um, well, that was something where um, Western accountability was not just so glaring. Well, half a century later, we view all this with knowledge of what followed. Population continues to grow, but the growth rate has been falling for half a century now, and it's now considered unlikely that population will uh, double um, again. In fact, overpopulation is no longer the defining concern of demography, at least on a global uh, scale. The defining concern among demographers nowadays is about uh, an aging world population. Um, and we also know that um, in addition to population control, which was a big discussion topic um, in the wake of early and this wave of neo Malthusianism, um, well, some of the solutions were um, um, solutions that had other benefits as well. Empowering women turned out to be one of the key steps in curb uh, in, in curbing uh, population growth. Women have fewer children across cultures if we if they have a say in uh, family. Uh, planning and all that makes it easy to depict neo Malthusianism as a baseless uh, scare or, at worst, just another chapter in a long tradition of environmental uh, alarmism. Um, I definitely mentioned those who view Malth neo Malthusian as a kind of racism because it depicts people with non white skin as a group that caused trouble. I won't go into that except by saying that it typically this, this point typically comes from people who never ever care about racism except when it comes to blame leftists for it. Now, against this backdrop of these concerns, it's important to remember that food supply is not a trivial issue. Feeding 8 billion humans, the population that we have on our planet right now, that is not a trivial uh, path. It's something that humans have never before um, done. Um, the world population, as you might know, uh, stood at 1 billion when Malthus was penning his famous uh, war, uh, warning. Um, so uh, we and and Borlaug and uh, early uh, when they wrote this was somewhere between three and four uh, million uh, billion uh, humans. Um, nobody could know at that time whether uh, it would be possible to feed eight billion humans. As it turns out, uh, we have not only enough food to feed everyone, but we have enough food to create a world population that, for the first time, has more people who are obese than starving. So. Um, but again, it's important to take the worries of that time. Um, as it is also um, uh, legitimate to point out that the quest for a green revolution did come down to a significant uh, step. And that is as much as Borlaug and his um, uh, colleagues uh, claim to do. Borlaug never said that the green revolution was the panacea. He merely argued that high yield varieties had brought time until population control can make a difference. That's one thing to point out when we talk about um, neo Malthusian. But there's a second point, which is about how we should join history and memory. Malthus may be disproved once more, um, um, something that happened over the 200 year span that he's been discussed, but maybe that makes it rather more important to deal with the shadows um, of the past. That is an argument that I've made uh, repeatedly. Um, and hopefully played a role in the uh, conveners um, making the choice for me as a keynoter that this point of memory, finding ways to deal with the ghosts of the past um, is really one of the ways in which we can make the humanities relevant for environmental uh, discussion. Um, and look at neo Malthusianism. This, this is still an overhanging trope. Um, it has poisoned our conversation on populations and left us with this uh, trope that was all overblown and all um, um, all uh, way too alarmist, if not racist. Um, well, this is the legacy and um, dealing with this by coming to terms with it and by taking stock of our mental inventories of the and themes and then look at how they were shaped over time. I think that's a key agenda um, for the environmental humanities. I don't think this makes people free of the past, but I think it gives them the tools to have a more sophisticated understanding of the acquired wisdoms, and it's certainly superior to just naively following these received wisdoms. So far, I've talked about the Cold War policies and the neo Malthusian waves. These are surely the two topics that are usually at the center of the story. 
less attention has gone to um, what is, at least if you look at Borla, the key business of the Green Revolution, plant breeding. The Green Revolution was about new varieties, particularly of wheat and rice, about how new seeds with um, promised higher yields per acre and um, plant breeding is actually a key uh, branch of agricultural science, a source of innovations that creates new breeds with high potential. Uh, at the same time, plant breeding is a tedious business. It's inherently boring. It's about planting, crossing, selecting, and see um, what we can food. And so we're dismissing most of the plants that have grown. If you want to have quick success, don't go, don't go into the plant breeding business. And I mentioned this not least because this may provide a quantum of solace for all doctoral students in the audience. Um, if you are stuck or you don't get forward with a project, um, or if it goes slower than you wish, well, keep in mind, um, imagine that you have to wait for plants to grow um, for several months. At least you do not suffer that phase. Plant breeding is um, a big business. Um, the search for better seas has been uh, going on and there is no guarantee that this will happen. There was the famous uh, Mexican case where the wheat breeding program is an astounding success. There is also an effort for maize that um, essentially fails. It's, um, well, success is at least long delayed, um, but it certainly doesn't have the same type of revolutionary breakthroughs. And there is a lot of in between. Uh, I take pride in citing the work of Kapil Subramanin, uh, who is uh, one of my future research fellows, um, uh, who just got the job offer. Congratulations, uh, Kapil, uh, who worked on the Green Revolution in India and pointed out that the um, there was a bumper crop in, in, in uh, India in 1968, um, which produced a lot of wheat, actually so much wheat that People had to store it in things like uh, cinemas um, th that gave pictures that resonated worldwide. But if you look at the full picture, you see that the um, 1960s were actually a period of relatively slow growth in uh, food grain production. The real revolution was about tube well um, irrigation. Um, so you see um, different uh, facets of this, different types of success. And so it's important to see the search for better search, uh, better seeds is nothing that starts with the green revolution or something plant breeding. Um, uh, it's really um, something that probably as, as old as agriculture itself. Maybe that is how agriculture started at some time in the fog of prehistory that humans realized that some greeds mo grow more than better and started to select from them. Um, so this is a quest for millennia, but it is now done with the means of modern science that make a difference here. Um, one is about institutions. If you set up institutions um, that make this selection process systematically, you have greater rigor, you have a greater range of samples, and you have the resources that um, institutional science um, has um, in, in um, continuing this quest. There's also the fact that scientists can bring in new plant material from around the world. The uh, key innovation for Warlock's Green Revolution was Norin Tan, which was a cultivar from uh, Japan, a semi-dwarf variety that doesn't grow tall and that thus could carry the exceptionally large ears um, that um, these new seeds produced. Without the ability, availability of seeds from other countries, the Green Revolution might not have happened. And the third innovation that modern science brings is that the early 1900s, we have a scientific understanding of how inheritance works thanks to the rediscovery of Mendel's laws of inheritance. Now, this modern scientific project was um, a nearly Western uh, project. Um, it focuses on the plants that are needed most in the West, and it focuses on growing conditions in the industrialized West. And in this context, it's important to realize how the Green Revolution um, marks a crucial shift towards uh, the global South. It is about dedicated research for warmer clients and a farewell to Western-centered research programs where other parts of the world may get um, um, may get just the, the tools that work for a different cause. So I think the Green Revolution does deserve credit for pushing breeding progress beyond the traditional geographic rearm. But with the growing role of scientists, there is a crucial question that uh, emerged: Who, after all, 
owns the uh, seat. Um, that is, again, something that I could elaborate on, but I'll uh, jump over that because we want to get to the discussion here. Um, the, the bottom line is that we have a very strong presence of private seat companies um, in, uh, well, in the world who, they, who occupy a, a very important part, who control um, uh, the biological resources that allow plant green to a very significant extent, something that even Norman Bollock uh, criticized. He gave a lecture at the Norwegian Nobel Institute in Oslo 30 years after receiving the Peace Award. And that's where he pressed concerns about oligop oligopolistic market. The quote, the high cost of biosearch is leading to a rapid consolidation in the ownership of agricultural life science companies. Is that desirable? That's 20 years ago. Um, the consolidation has, if anything, um, gathered steam over the last two decades. Easy to criticize, not easy to change, but in this context, important to understand how the Green Revolution empowers the uh, public sector. The Green Revolution research in Mexico was run by a semi-autonomous government body, the Office of Special Studies uh, under the Mexican Ministry of Agriculture and Animal Husbandry. This became the International Maize and Wheat Improvement Center, CIMIT, uh, in 1963. And that word, CIMIT, is something that resonates in the world of agriculture to this day. Um, and uh, the Green Revolution seeds were always seeds that um, were bred to be there for reuse from the farmers, and thus there was a counterweight to the power of seed companies. So the Green Revolution was also a product of the great age of state-sponsored research after the Second World War, and that era has come to a close in the wake of a neoliberal age where the private sector was the natural source of innovation and where um, a conventional wisdom uh, held that the state was just tradinistic, unimaginative. That was also always a cliche, and it certainly was a cliche for uh, plant breeding. In fact, you can make a case that with these long time spans for all innovation, um, plant breeding is a field where the state has an edge. But then it's important to realize that better yields are not just a matter of better seeds. Um, agriculture is a classic field where a lot of things uh, need to come uh, together. You need the right seeds, the right weather, the right soil, the right combination of nutrients. You need effective pest control, disease control. Biology is complicated and innovations hinge on um, improvements on a broad range of factors. So the success of the Green Revolution hinged on other factors that were improved in other uh, measures. And that is quite literally the case. The Green Revolution seeds were bred for high fertilizer inputs. Uh, and that is a perennial discussion points that when farmers got these new seeds, they also needed to buy um, fertilizer. Again, this is a global um, a trend, um, the trend towards more technology, more complex machines, greater use of fertilizers and uh, pesticides. Um, and it needs to be discussed in this way, because one consequence of this transformation of production methods was that um, the technology um, cost a lot of money. And well, that money was not available to all farmers. Social inequality is a key issue, probably the issue that tarnished the reputation of the Green Revolution more than anything. Um, else. The simple fact that many farmers, many smallholders uh, were unable to afford the new seeds and thus had to give up and gave their lands to people with greater uh, means. And I think it's important to look at this trend in a global context. Um, again, this transformation of agricultural methods happens in the North um, as well. There is a rapid loss of jobs in agriculture in the post-war years. Uh, there's a long-term decline, of course, since the 19th century, but in, in the post-war years, this is uh, a landslide. People move to the cities in great numbers or commute to work in the cities, and, and farmers are now as a minority even in the countryside. Uh, but if you look at this trend um, in the West, you see that this trend is remarkably silent, um, particularly if you look that this is a pretty brutal um, story, that this has massive consequences for so many um, people. Um, but it's effectively the end of a rural world, um, the world, um, the sphere where most people grew up before the 20th century, that world is gone within a single generation because it basically 
uh, implodes. Why does this happen in a rather smooth way? One reason is there was this transition was buffered by generous welfare policies. In, in Europe, that was the common agricultural policy, which is now viewed by EU historians as effectively a welfare uh, policy, um, where politicians basically made a point of not leaving the countryside uh, behind. Um, that's one reason. The other reason was that the cities had really good jobs. So if you left your plot of land, if you get to the city uh, in the boom years where unemployment was low or even a few years you had full employment, you could be certain that you will get a decent pay paying job. And if you keep that in mind and look at the global south, you see that a lot of these buffers that existed in the industrialism, there just didn't exist in the global south. Uh, there is not a state that offers much in terms of welfare payments um, for the agricultural transition. Um, the focus on industry is overwhelming in uh, the newly independent uh, countries of the global south. And we all know that these um, countries have mushrooming uh, slum areas where a lot of peasants ended um, up. So the global south elect the means to provide the kind of buffer that made the agricultural transition smooth in the industrialized world. It's easy to lament about that. It's difficult to find um, um, an alternative. That is the story of the faceless rural worker that I will only touch on briefly here, but that's really the toughest part of the global history of uh, monoculture. Um, there are winners in this story. Engineers, operators of complex machines, land owners who catch the raves at the right time. If you are technologically savvy, you can see the agricultural revolution of the post-war years as an opportunity, but that's not the case for everyone. The fate of those who do not ride the wave is about shades of misery. And very often we're talking about migrant workers from the more desolate parts um, of the globe. And I think that adds another layer of question and adds to the um, ambivalences of this uh, story. There is a brutal slogan that once it goes back to Earl Bass, uh, US Secretary of Agriculture, um, in the post-war years, get bigger, get better, or get out. Wachsen oder Weichen was the German uh, version of that. And that's actually what, what has happened. I mean, the threshold um, for large, um, 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 large farms is increasing all the threat in the, the German Wachstumsschwelle, which is the threshold above which the number of uh, farms increases um, and below which the number of farms decreases. It's now at more than 100 hectares. Um, so there are options, but if you do not have 100 hectares, things may get nasty for you. And um, for all this transition, there are just means options that small peasants uh, do not have. And just to amplify this story here, it is important to realize the dominant perspective on post-war farming comes from urbanites um, fewer and fewer people have first-hand experience in uh, farming. Um, many people take the cornucopia in the supermarket as a given nowadays. It's always easy to criticize uh, farmers for the use of pesticides, uh, for handling animals. The struggle over GMO is emblematic for this rift between farmers on the one side and urbanites who think GMOs is just um, beyond the pale. Um, and um, yeah, lack of understanding is a very important part um, of today's debate over agriculture. Um, I won't elaborate on the workers and on the ignorance of urbanites here because I would like to leave my final thoughts for uh, an important issue, namely how do we bring all this together? This is a conference on ambivalences, but if you look at the set of narratives that we've eclored, well, there is very little ambivalence in each individual story. You know, the Cold War is about political power play, overpopulation fears, Malthusian fears, um, um, were um, a, a clear scenario when we know that it didn't work out as intended. There is the plant breeding story about seeds that allow greater yields per hectare, but only with the right ingredients, uh, water, mineral fertilizer, energy, etc. There's the story of rural labor, as a story of exploitation and despair more often. And there is the story of um, urban amnesia. In each case, we find a clear dominant theme and we kind of hear a paradigm, a clear narrative about what happens out. The key challenge is 
that these narratives do not add up. They do not come together in a coherent conclusion that we could present in a nice way. And I think one of the reasons why we have so much trouble to tell more than one of these stories is that many of these narratives are loaded with fear. That's why we still talk about Malthus, for instance, because the fear of starvation has stuck a nerve and the trope resonates to this deer. And when fear is in play, it is hard to deal with ambivalences. Fear stifles thinking. It narrows minds. It encourages people to focus on one th on the one issue that matters. And part of the problem is that there is no good remedy uh, for uh, fear. Um, but maybe that is a task for the um, historian and for other humanities scholars. No, we cannot get rid of fear, but we can put fear in context and we can talk about how fear um, plays a role in essentializing things that should be told in a multidimensional way. Again, my point about how memory, getting memory studies into this field, talking about how memories are constructed, how fear is an accelerator of this closing of minds, all that empowers people to um, talk about these matters in a more sophisticated way. But I don't want to leave it at this uh, graph um, here, but I would like to uh, offer you one final thought about how um, a solution could look like. And that is with the express purpose to open this up for discussion now. Namely, what happens if biographies are a way to tell stories of the past? Because we can, when we talk about the fear, this is something where you know people have dealt with fear in the past, and maybe we should look at these um, men who dealt with fear and who took decisions in the face of fear. And in case you are concerned about gendered language, well, I'm afraid we really need to talk about men here because that's what they were mostly um, men. The modern world of agriculture thrives on a good dose of testosterone and maybe even a soldier-like attitude among the people who build the modern world of uh, food. And maybe we should make a greater effort to get into the mind of these uh, people and write biographies of the men of monoculture, not in an adoring fashion, of course, but as an effort to um, get into the mind of these uh, people. We know what happened with this. They got bigger, but what went up, off, uh, went on, here in the head of, in this case, Norman Borlaug. How, what, well, how did they take decisions when they knew that all options were ambivalent? How did they deal with their doubts? How did they deal with criticism? Did they have afterthoughts? And after all, what kind of power did they um, have? The agricultural history of the modern world is about burning needs. It's about the raw forces of global capitalism. That's not the environment where experts are particularly strong. So I'm currently thinking as part of my first year exercise with the ERC project. I'm going to think about writing a biography of Bolo, if the archival material allows. Uh, maybe this will be a sole biography, maybe one of a set of biographies. But I think it's a worthwhile effort to get under the skin of these people, to understand how they dealt with ambivalences, how they charted a path uh, when all things looked uh, bad, to the extent that it maybe just went with the flow. I don't think they are necessarily a role model, um, but they are a way to understand what ambivalences do uh, to uh, humans. And we need those role models. Um, um, no, it's not, not those role models, but we need people who understand what people do in the face of uh, humans. Um, because whatever happens in the 21st century about food and humans, there is a clear need to act. It's absolutely clear that there is no way to go uh, on here, but then who takes the initiative with what authority, with a goal, and what kind of mindset, um, and what kind of idea, what kind of thinking? These are all open questions, and maybe by looking at the way men of monoculture thought, we can find something that gives us ideas about how to do this. So, this is a worthy topic for future study and a good topic, maybe for the discussion um, um, once I turn this video. Thank you so much for bearing with me and for allowing me to do this uh, by video and I look forward to your questions and comments.